this will be kind of a whirlwind talk. Um, as Tommy mentioned, there'll be a lot of show and tell. I'm going to be showing you a lot of photographs that I hope will help you recognize things. Um, I've gone through all the content specifications for the dermatology portion, and I believe this covers everything. So if you know the stuff in this handout, you're going to know more than you need to know for this part of the board exam. So the first um, part of this lecture is going to be talking primarily about atopic dermatitis. We'll be going through a differential diagnosis and talking about dermatitis in general and, again, hitting on high points that you might see on the boards. Hopefully there will be some helpful um, practical clinical information as well. And then about 75% of the talk is going to be a case-based presentation where you guys will do the audience response. All right, so we'll get going. So we're going to start with atopic dermatitis. This is also known as eczema or the itch that rashes. And this is very, very common, affecting about 10 to 15 percent of children and adolescents. And it's estimated that about 20 percent of pediatric dermatology visits and 1 percent of pediatric visits are for atopic dermatitis. So we're going to go through epidemiology. We're going to focus on clinical features, differential diagnosis, some of the clinical associations and complications, as well as treatment options. And here we see a young lady who has the typical facial features of atopic dermatitis with these very pronounced red plaques with overlying crust on the cheeks. And I'll show you quite a few more examples. So atopic dermatitis is a chronic inflammatory skin condition that's characterized by dry skin or xerosis, itching known as pruritus, and recurrent skin lesions that tend to occur in a specific pattern. And there's usually a strong family history of atopy. This is primarily a disease of childhood. The vast majority of, of children will present with atopic dermatitis in the first five years of age, about 90 percent. And more than half of the children that have atopic dermatitis will actually present in their first year of life. Um, however, fortunately, the, the prevalence of this condition decreases through age, and many children will spontaneously resolve over time. We don't know why, but there has been an increasing prevalence of this skin disease um, in developed countries and urban cities over the last 30 years. It's hard to know if this is in part due to increased recognition of atopic dermatitis or if this is due to significant changes in our environment or lifestyle. Um, some theories include that we have less exposure to infection and potentially less exposure to different allergens. The exact etiology remains unknown. Uh, there does appear to be an important familiar or genetic uh, factor. Um, as well, uh, there have been numerous studies now that have shown that uh, mutations in the filaggrin gene are strongly associated with both atopic dermatitis, asthma, and ichthyosis vulgaris, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Filaggrin is an important protein in the formation of the stratum corneum, which is responsible for the barrier function of skin. Um, it's believed that the etiology of atopic dermatitis is really due to a complex interaction between these genetic factors as well as environmental factors. The role of food allergies, somewhat controversial and not clearly understood. In general, food allergy tends to be overdiagnosed. Patients that have severe atopic dermatitis usually have very high IgE levels and often have many false positive um, tests when you're doing food allergy testing. However, I think a significant subset or minority of patients do truly have food allergies that contribute to the severity of their atopic dermatitis. And you, if you have a child that has particularly severe disease, this is something you want to think about, especially if they're very recalcitrant to a good uh, skin care regimen. Now, the diagnostic criteria of atopic dermatitis, um, there are some criteria that was proposed more than 30 years ago by Hannafin and Rajka. And there are several major features. And for a diagnosis, you need to have three of these major features. And that would include the itching or pruritus. This should be a chronic or relapsing dermatitis, not just a one-time episode that lasts for a few weeks or a few months. Um, there is generally a personal or family history of atopic disease. And that could either be the atopic dermatitis or asthma or allergic rhinitis. And then a typical morphology and distribution of the skin lesions. And we're going to go through examples of that. The clinical lesions with atopic dermatitis really vary depending on the stage of the disease. When you have very acute lesions, you'll usually see a lot of erythema, redness, as well as blister formation, weeping, crusting. With um, more chronic disease, sometimes you'll see uh, more formation of scaling, lots of excoriations, and you may see lichenification, which is shown actually right here on the elbow. You can see lichenification quite nicely. This is when you have thickening of the skin which usually appears the skin is a little bit darker, and you'll see pronounced skin markings. 
so we, we de um, describe atopic dermatitis as having several clinical phases. The first is the infantile phase, and this is usually beginning between about one and two months of age and usually continues until about one, one and a half years of age. And I'll show you photographs of that. Childhood phase is generally beginning somewhere between about 18 and 24 months and continues till puberty, and then we have the adolescent and adult phase. So the infantile phase, all of these phases are going to have dryness and itching of the skin. The distribution with infantile phases usually, like that picture I showed a few slides ago, usually a lot of involvement of the cheeks and scalp. Um, there's often extensive trunk involvement, and often there is a significant involvement of the extensor extremities. And that can be a helpful clinical clue when you're trying to discern between atopic dermatitis and seborrheic dermatitis. Another really helpful clue is the diaper area is generally spared with the infantile um, phase of atopic dermatitis. Um, really young infants aren't particularly good at scratching, but they're very good at rubbing. So oftentimes they're rubbing their face, they're rubbing their wrists or their ankles against furniture or things to try to relieve their, their itching sensation. And I think probably the hardest thing to differentiate in those first few months of life is atopic dermatitis and seborrheic dermatitis. And you'll see some photographs of both. I will say, though, I do think a significant um, number of patients have an overlap of these two conditions. So here again, we see typical infantile distribution. We see these prominent lesions on the cheeks. There usually is some sparing of these nasolabial folds here. Sorry, I'm having a little trouble getting, there we go. So you can see the sparing around the nose. Similar patient again, very pronounced involvement of the cheeks, but sparing around the nose. You can see this child has excoriations, which are very commonly seen. The skin looks edematous. And this is an extensor surface of an arm. You can see a little more thickening of the skin here, a little bit of overlying scale. And more lichenification. This is probably a more chronic um, condition in this patient. You can see lichenification with the darkening and the thickening of the skin. You also see some excoriations and some scaling. And two more examples showing the difference between lighter skin and darker skin. The redness is always much more pronounced in the more fairly complected children. Um, in the darker skinned individual, sometimes it's harder to appreciate the redness, and redness or inflammation can actually look like darkening of the skin. But you see these two children have a very similar distribution, again, with involvement of their extensor extremities um, and also fairly extensive on the trunk and the one on the right. And then uh, diffuse patchy involvement on the trunk is very, very common in young infants. However, as I mentioned a couple minutes ago, sparing, dramatic sparing of the bottom area, the diaper area, is a helpful clue for atopic dermatitis because with seborrheic dermatitis, you're usually going to have a lot of diaper involvement. And it's believed that the moisture in that area is what helps um, prevent there from being lesions in the kids with atopic dermatitis. And here's another example. You can see pretty marked involvement of the trunk with a, a fairly dramatic demarcation here where the diaper starts. So the childhood phase is similar. You've got chronic dermatitis. You can get lichenification, excoriations. The main difference is that you tend to have less involvement of the extensor extremities, but more involvement of the flexural extremities. So by toddler and, and young childhood, we're usually seeing a lot of involvement of the antecubital fossa and the popliteal fossa. Still a lot of facial involvement, as you can see in this child here. This child has a lot of weeping, crusting, excoriations. Still a lot of hand involvement. And then here we see the popliteal involvement or the flexural extremities involved. And here we see the antecubital fossa. All right, and then moving on to the adolescent and adult phase, they continue to have flexural involvement, but they also tend to develop hand and foot dermatitis, and it's often that they have periocular involvement. Um, it's believed that the increased hand involvement may be due to more contact exposures. So here we see the periocular involvement that's quite dramatic. You can see hyperpigmentation, a lot of lichenification from chronic rubbing around her eyes. You could see a very similar clinical presentation. This was just limited to the eyelids. You would certainly want to think about some sort of an allergic contact dermatitis to some kind of makeup or something on that order.
And here another example of the periorbital involvement. And then the neck is a very common area to be involved in older children, adolescents, and adults. And here again we see the, the significant neck involvement, which is often circumferential. More popliteal involvement. Here you can see you don't see a lot of redness. Here we see more hyperpigmentation or darkening of the skin, but there is inflammation there, and you can see the lichenification. The hand involvement with, with frequent excoriations. And then just we've mentioned already seborrheic dermatitis, especially in infants, is, a, is sometimes tough to differentiate between atopic dermatitis. This is a list of some of the other things I'm going to now show you some photographs of and talk about what some of the um, characteristic differences are between these conditions that are occasionally confused with atopic dermatitis. So lichen striatus is an interesting condition. This is a self-limited condition. It's usually asymptomatic. It tends to be a linear dermatitis, and that linear nature is your biggest clue to lichen striatus. So if you see something that looks like it's extending in a band-like pattern, you want to think about lichen striatus. Most commonly seen in children ages 2 to 10. It's usually unilateral, so another clue. Atopic dermatitis is usually very symmetrical. Um, and typically, this is a linear band of coalescing, skin color to pink, flat top papules, or what we call lichenoid papules. Fortunately, this condition tends to go away on its own within about several months, usually within a year or so. However, it often leaves some hypopigmentation or decreased pigmentation in darker skinned individuals. So here we see a couple examples. You can see this nice linear pattern here, coalescing pink papules forming a linear plaque and a similar lesion on the abdomen here. And here's another, that's it on lichen striatus. This is another condition. Can you guys guess what this is right here? Right, so it's a reaction to flip-flops. So probably something in the, in the, the rubber of the flip-flops. So we can see this very distinct pattern here, which is our clue that this is an allergic contact dermatitis. If you look at it under the microscope, it looks very similar to eczema. So the same thing is happening, but it's the distribution that's your clue, and often the age of onset. So contact dermatitis can either be allergic in nature or irritant in nature. And you can see contact dermatitis even in young infants as young as six months of age. The most common cause of contact dermatitis in children is a nickel or metal allergy. Other things to consider include preservatives. That could be preservatives and moisturizers, medications, soaps, um, topical medications, sometimes dyes, fragrances, and plant resins. So here we see an example. This is a more acute example of allergic contact dermatitis. So this is like what you would see in poison ivy, for example. You can see that the skin is edematous. There's some vesiculation in this patient. It's probably very itchy. Um, there's erythema. So just it can look quite similar to atopic dermatitis. This is an example of a patient that just has skin lesions around her eyes. So this patient most likely has an allergic contact dermatitis. So again, very similar in appearance, but it's the age of onset and the distribution that's your clue. Uh, I think we've touched on all of that. The only thing else I'd like to mention is when you have, probably the most common thing I see in my practice, and, and probably the same for you all, um, is peri-umbilical involvement. Um, so kids who have nickel allergy, usually the area you'll see the involvement is right under the umbilicus. That's the most common area. Now that kids are wearing their jeans lower, it can be quite a bit below their belly button. Um, so when they have that, sometimes they don't just have the area where the nickel from the, the metal snap or the belt buckle is. Um, sometimes they'll develop an id reaction, which is like a generalized hypersensitivity reaction. And then those patients will often get fine papules, oftentimes um, involving the extensor arms and legs. So sometimes that can be a little tricky if you haven't seen that before. But it's a, a very uh, common presentation for nickel allergy. So here we see the um, infra-umbilical um, eczematous plaques here. Now this child, what do you think she's reacting to? probably something she's sitting on. So the metal rivets in the school chair most likely. So it can appear in a variety of places depending on what the exposure is. This is just showing an example of a patch test to demonstrate that this patient or to confirm that she has a true nickel allergy. So this was a panel of allergens put on the back 
the one in the left upper quarter you might guess is the nickel response, so a positive reaction. So that can help if the clinical presentation is not um, real clear cut. All right, shifting gears. What do you all see in this picture? What are all these little bumps? Exactly. Now, sometimes the bumps aren't so obvious, but the dermatitis is very apparent, and that's what the patient presents for is, you know, new onset of eczematous um, patches, usually in the flexural areas. But sometimes molluscum can call the, cause a very uh, pronounced dermatitis that we just call molluscum dermatitis. This is believed to be an immunologic response, inflammatory response to the molluscum virus. Um, but that's usually what's causing the symptoms. The bumps aren't symptomatic, but the dermatitis around it is. And if you don't have real obvious bumps, sometimes this can just be confused with, with eczema or atopic dermatitis. When we see this, we try to do lots of emollients and usually treat that with low-potency topical steroids. All right, this is another condition that's sometimes confused with atopic dermatitis. So this is the same child here on the left and the right. So we see numerous erythematous papules and nodules in different stages. We see some areas that look like they've urticated. There's some areas that look like they might be secondarily infected. Anyone want to throw something out for this one? Scabies, yes. And babies tend to have very dramatic scabies where they um, don't just get, you know, involvement of the finger, or the web spaces. They typically have more generalized skin involvement. They often have scalp involvement, unlike older children and adults. Um, and the lesions can be very polymorphous, as we see here with papules, vesicles, pustules, nodules, urtication, sometimes eczematous changes, and secondary infection. This is the more classic presentation. This is what we tend to see in older children, adolescents, and adults, where we see redness and scaling uh, in interdigital spaces. But kids don't always, little kids don't always present like that. So as you know, scabies is an infestation with the scabies mite. Um, this is an eruption of pyritic lesions, papules, vesicles, pustules, nodules. If you're lucky, you'll see burrows. I see those most commonly, it seems, around the wrists and the ankles. Um, and it can be very, very generalized. And the thing you want to remember is even if you successfully treat the scabies, sometimes the inflammatory response can last several weeks or even months, and that can make you really question your diagnosis and wonder what else is going on. Uh, we refer to those persistent nodules as post-scabitic nodules. All right, so here is another example, very typical presentation of, of um, an infant that has scabies. And I think another helpful clue when you're seeing these kids in person is sometimes the lesions in a light-skinned kiddo um, have more of an orangish-brown appearance. This is a very long-standing case of scabies, so more of what you would see with crusted scabies, uh, what used to be referred to as Norwegian scabies. So we can see a lot of scaling, and you can see where sometimes these kids might be confused for really bad atopic dermatitis when they have extensive scaling and the condition has been going on for a long period of time. This is an immunosuppressed adolescent that I took care of a few years ago that had leukemia and was on chemotherapy, and he again presented with more of a crusted scabies. Uh, we can see he really has what looks like eczematous plaques on his elbows, but then when you examined his hands, he had more typical features of scabies. Now, in young infants, what we'll see most commonly are pustules and vesicles on the palms and soles. So anytime you see those findings, you really want to think about scabies. And then, if you're, again, if you're lucky, you'll might, you might see some burrows in those areas as well. This is an example of a burrow on the side of the hand, this curvilinear uh, lesion right here. And that's, if you are, have the good fortune to see that, then you want to do a scraping, and then you can confirm your diagnosis by identifying the, the mite. Or sometimes you'll really hit the jackpot, and you will get the mite, and you'll get the eggs, as we see here, these nice oval things, and then you'll get the feces. So, and then if your parents don't believe you, then you can bring them in and show them the microscope and you know, make them feel more confident about that diagnosis, especially if it's been going on a while and maybe they haven't responded to treatment. So in regards to treatment, um, standard of care is to use 5% permethrin for infants that are less than um, 
sorry, that are older than six weeks of age. For younger infants and pregnant females, we usually use precipitated sulfur mix in an ointment-based emollient. You tend to, uh, you want to treat the patient that's affected twice. You want to treat them and then repeat the treatment in one week. You want to treat all family members and close contacts. And then also you want to make sure that they're doing the appropriate laundering precautions. These are two examples of the post-scabitic nodules I was mentioning. And when I first started seeing these, I just couldn't believe that was related to the scabies, so I biopsied them just to make sure I wasn't missing something else. But both of these patients definitely had post nodules. And really, the only way to get rid of those is to use high-potency topical steroids and, and lots of patients. All right. I'm going to show you a couple pictures of seborrheic dermatitis. Seborrheic dermatitis is also known as seborrhea. Um, it commonly involves the, the scalp, and when that's the case, it's uh, referred to as cradle cap. It also very commonly involves the intertriginous skin, so the axilla, the neck, the um, inguinal folds, for example, popliteal fossa and cubital fossa. And this is a self-limited condition. It usually resolves by about six months of age. It tends to be asymptomatic, so they can look much, much worse than they feel. Um, and because it's uh, self-limited, we aren't terribly aggressive with our treatment. We usually use shampoos containing ketoconazole or selenium sulfide. We use mineral oil to the scalp. Um, we'll sometimes use low-potency topical steroids. Um, sometimes we will mix that with a topical antifungal. And then certainly emollients. This is another example. Again, the flexural skin folds. You can see the involvement around the ear, which is very common. You see it circumferentially around the neck. This is often very red. It can be very macerated. And the main thing you want to worry about with this is that it can become secondarily infected. Okay. This is a condition that is commonly confused with eczema. Um, patients will usually present with symmetrical follicular-based small papules that are skin color to pink. Um, usually symmetrically on the cheeks, the upper outer arms, and the upper thighs. And this is an example of keratosis pilaris. This is a very, very common condition. It tends to run in families. It has an autosomal dominant uh, transmission. Um, again, usually not symptomatic, but more bothersome from a cosmetic standpoint or just not liking that rough uh, feel of the skin. And this is seen more commonly in children that do have a history of dry skin, and sometimes it is seen in the setting of atopic dermatitis. And this also tends to improve with time. So here are a couple additional examples. You can see that with this fair-skinned individual, you see a lot more redness. And then in the darker-skinned individual, you can appreciate the bumps, and you can feel it more, but you don't see as much redness as you do in the lighter skin. This is an example in a younger patient. You can see these follicular uh, pink to red papules. Again, you often feel just very rough skin. And unfortunately, there's no fix for this. I always tell families and parents that this is really more of a skin type than a skin disease. And we really focus on just avoiding any um, products that might irritate the skin. We avoid fragrance and dyes and use lots of moisturizers. And sometimes we'll use moisturizers that have exfoliating ingredients like lactic acid or urea, or sometimes in the older kids, we might use some of the acne medicines like the topical retinoids. All right, another condition that can be confused with eczema that's often seen in the setting of eczema is what this youngster has right here. You can see this plate-like scale extending along the, the shin. And this is an example of ichthyosis vulgaris. Ichthyosis just means scaly skin. Um, ichthyosis vulgaris is the most common type of ichthyosis. This is also spread in an auto autosomal dominant inheritance pattern. It usually presents in the first year of life, and this often varies a lot depending on the climate and where the patient lives. It tends to get much better with warm, humid weather. And these patients will tend to have very pronounced scales particularly over the extensor extremities with sparing of the flexural surfaces. Um, another helpful clue is if you look at their palms and the soles, you'll often see that they have hyperlinearity of those surfaces. And similar to atopic dermatitis, it, it uh, appears that this, is, this condition is due to uh, loss of function mutations in the filaggrin gene. <coughs> 
So here are two more examples of ichthyosis vulgaris. Again, you can see the scaling appearance on the extensor extremities and here in this child, but very pronounced sparing of the flexural surfaces. However, if they happen to have ichthyosis vulgaris and atopic dermatitis, you may not be able to appreciate the sparing of the flexural involvement because that is usually where your atopic dermatitis is going to manifest itself. And similar to some of these other treatments, um, or sorry, these other conditions, treatment is again based on avoiding irritants, using lots of emollients, and sometimes using keratolytic products, especially in older children, um, products that have lactic acid. We tend to avoid using products that have significant amounts of salicylic acid, especially in infants and young children that have a larger body surface area due to the concerns of absorption. And then some of these patients will have associated itching with the condition or atopic dermatitis, and so then you would address those concerns as well. Okay, so this is a condition that's very commonly confused with fungal infections. These patients usually present in the summertime. They're usually darkly pigmented patients to begin with, and then they come in and they have these blotchy, you know, light patches, usually on both cheeks and sometimes on their arms. And this is an example of pityriasis, uh, sorry, pityriasis alba. And this, is, again, is very common, usually seen with darker skin. It may be seen in the setting of atopic dermatitis, uh, or it may be seen by itself uh, without atopic dermatitis. Uh, occasionally, there can be some associated pruritus. It's really more of a cosmetic concern. Um, and this tends to resolve spontaneously as the tan fades. And we treat this typically with good photoprotection and lots of moisturizer use. This is an example that, don't know how well this projects, but this child is obviously has lighter skin and so it does have some poorly defined hypopigmented patches, but they're not nearly as dramatic as they are with the darker skin. Okay. So now we're going to spend a few minutes talking about atopic dermatitis and your treatment approach. So I think probably the most important thing when you have a patient with atopic dermatitis is extensive education, that this is a chronic condition, that we don't have a cure, and our goal is to control the condition and to improve the quality of life. There very rarely is one specific cause or one specific allergy that causes a person to have atopic dermatitis. And this is what I typically see. By the time they get to our office, they come in with the bag and they have like 20 different things or more that they've tried with variable success and there's usually a lot of frustration that is, is associated with that. Um, so the, I think you always want to start with treating these patients with a very good sensitive skin care regimen. And so again, you're going to avoid fragrances and dyes which might irritate the skin. You want to get them using regular emollients on a daily basis. Um, you want them to avoid triggers, which can be a variety of things, dust mites, wool clothing, um, sometimes it's certain defined allergies, animal exposure, cigarette smoke, that kind of thing. Um, and then beyond that, you really need to treat the symptoms. You need to treat the inflammation. You need to look for signs of secondary infection. You need to treat the itching. Um, and we're going to go through each of these things in, in a little bit of detail. So these are the common triggers, and it varies from person to person, and usually patients can begin to identify um, their triggers after they get to be at least a few years of age, you know, certain seasons where they have more problems, um, certain stresses, whether that be emotional stresses or whether it's physical stress and their eczema flares every time they get sick. Um, we already mentioned some of these other things, certain foods, and certainly infection can trigger atopic dermatitis. So we generally recommend regular skin hydration. The frequency of bathing is somewhat controversial, and there's not a lot of good evidence-based um, literature to back up these recommendations. But um, I would say most pediatric dermatologists generally recommend daily baths, lukewarm water, a few minutes, um, again, avoiding soaps with dyes and fragrance, and then um, a prompt application of moisturizers right after the bath. Ointments and creams tend to be more effective than lotions, and we encourage families to use them several times a day, again, ideally right after the bath or shower when the skin is still damp. So unfortunately, when there is a great degree of inflammation, 
you cannot really treat that without using a specific medicine that's going to diminish the inflammation. So you can moisturize and it's going to make it better, but it may not be enough to make the inflammation resolve completely. So first-line therapy for the infl inflammation in atopic dermatitis is going to be using topical steroids. And the goal, you know, you want to think about the age of the child, the location where you're putting the topical steroids. The goal is always to use the mildest strength topical steroid that you can for the shortest duration of time that you can to control the symptoms. We know there's a number of side effects that can go along with use of topical steroids, but I think we also have to think about the morbidity that goes along with atopic dermatitis and weigh the pros and cons of the medication when, again, with, when approaching each child. So some of the more common things, especially in adolescents, if you're using them on the face, it may cause or worsen acne, it can sometimes cause folliculitis. With prolonged treatment um, of specific areas of skin, sometimes you can see skin atrophy. When you see skin atrophy, you'll often see telangiectasia or dilated blood vessels, or you may see a tendency to bruise more easily in those areas. And then for children that have more se severe disease where you're using topical steroids on large surface areas, they do have some risk of developing adrenal suppression if they're using um, chronic topical steroids. So you probably know that topical steroids have been grouped in different classes depending on their strength. These range from very mild topical steroids, which are, are categorized as class 7, to the ultra-potent ones, which are class 1. And the vehicle of the steroid um, can actually affect its potency greatly. Po uh, ointments tend to penetrate more so than creams, and so they tend to be more potent. And I'll show you a couple examples. So this is not uh, an all-inclusive list. We all know there's many more topical steroids out there. But I, I recommend just being familiar with one or two in each given class, a low potency, a moderate potency, and a high potency. So we can see that class 7 is what we probably use most frequently, especially in infants and very young children. So hydrocortisone ointment, 1 or 2.5%. Um, it's going to be the least potent and the safest. Then we get up into the mid-potency. And we can see that while mometasone cream, for example, is a class 4, so mid-potency, if you use mometasone ointment, then you jump up to a class 2. So it's just important to keep that in mind, that the medicine strength can vary depending on whether it's a cream, lotion, or ointment, with ointments almost always being the strongest. And then in general, we don't use a lot of class 1 uh, and class 2 topical steroids in young children because we worry more about those side effects that we just uh, touched upon. So again, low to mid-potency uh, mid topical steroids are going to be used most frequently for flares of atopic dermatitis in children. And you want to be taking special care if you're treating the face and particularly the diaper area. Um, the diaper area is occluded, which will enhance absorption, so you're far more likely to develop some of these side effects like atrophy of the skin and more absorption. And I not too long ago saw a baby that had been given a class 1 topical steroid, so very potent in the diaper area for several weeks, and unfortunately was complete, completely cushingoid and had developed hypertension. So it does happen. So again, the... The point here is you only want to use very mild potency steroids in the diaper area for brief periods of time. Okay, um, we don't generally use topical steroids more than twice daily. They should always be used in combination with emollients, and then you should always try to decrease the strength of the topical steroid as the condition improves, um, and then continue the topical emollients. All right. So another category of medications that can be used for inflammation in atopic dermatitis are the topical immunomodulators. And my slide says they're new, but they're not so new anymore. They've been around about 12 years or so or been approved for that time frame. But compared to topical steroids, they're new. And most people consider these uh, second-line treatments. So they have different mechanism of action. One of the biggest benefits of the topical immunomodulators is that they don't cause skin atrophy. So that's a big advantage when you're treating the diaper area or the face, for example. Um, these are topical calcineurin inhibitors. They block cytokine inflammation, sorry, cytokine expression and subsequently inflammation. So protopic or topical tacrolimus was the first immunomodulator that was approved for the treatment of atopic dermatitis. And it is FDA approved, but it is only approved 
as a second line agent for moderate to severe atopic dermatitis. And this is for patients that are two years and older. There are two strengths. They are both ointments. The lower strength is 0.03% and that's approved for children two to 15 years of age. And then the 0.1%, which is approved for children 15 years and older. And again, neither of these products are FDA approved for use less than two years of age. There have been some concerns that topical tacrolimus can be absorbed. So it needs to be used with great care, especially in patients that have a lot of open, eroded skin where you know the barrier is not normal and they're going to absorb a significant amount of that medicine. You don't want to use it on large surface areas and you don't want to use it with uh, occlusion. So you wouldn't want to use it with wet wrap therapy, for example. The other topical immunomodulator was approved the following year in 2001. This is known as pimecrolimus or Elidil. And this was developed specifically to treat inflammatory skin conditions. Um, it is a little bit less potent than topical tacrolimus. Um, and it is approved for second line treatment of mild to moderate versus moderate to severe eczema. And again, for children two years and older. And there's only one strength, which is the 1%. And it's to be used for short-term or intermittent management. So I'm not going to go into great detail, but if you are prescribing these medications, I do think it's important that you know that both of them have a black box label on them. And there is some question about concern of uh, increasing the risk of developing either skin cancers or other malignancies with long-term use. And that actual risk, I think, still is somewhat uncertain if it is truly um, a concern or not, and there are some ongoing studies looking at long-term use, looking at the, the safety aspects of these medicines. Okay. So again, I think take-home points here, topical steroids should be first-line treatment for um, atopic dermatitis when you have inflammatory skin lesions. Topical immunomodulators offer a steroid sparing option, um, but should be used as labeled and with caution. Okay, so now let's talk a little bit about some of the complications that we can see in atopic dermatitis. Um, probably the most common complication we see is secondary infection. So here we can see a child who has atopic dermatitis on the cheek and has some secondary scaling and crusting here and this certainly looks to be impetigenized or infected. That's when you can use topical antimicrobial therapies and, and it can be quite effective, uh, especially if it's a localized problem like in the case of that cheek. Um, soaks can be very, very helpful at gently debriding those areas. We use acetic acid and aluminum um, acetate soaks, uh, such as Domeboro soaks, um, and they have astringent and antibacterial effects. So that can be a helpful approach. We certainly want to treat the itching. Um, sometimes antihistamines can be very helpful depending on the age of the child and the time of the itching. You have the option of sedating or non-sedating antihistamines. We tend to use sedating antihistamines primarily at nighttime to aid with sleep. There's some question about how helpful they are with controlling pruritus, but in some children it can be very helpful for giving them enough uh, relief and sedation that they do sleep better at nighttime. And there are very few randomized controlled studies that look at the effects of antihistamines. So we know that children with atopic dermatitis have lots of secondary skin infections, and these can be bacterial, viral, or fungal. Other morbidity with the condition includes altered growth, which we'll talk briefly about, altered sleep, which is usually related to the severe pruritus of their skin, and significant psychosocial effects, which is probably multifactorial. So the epidermis is the, the first physical line of defense against microbial organisms, and we know that the barrier is not normal in the setting of atopic dermatitis, and therefore becomes more susceptible to um, different types of skin infections. We also know that about 90% of patients that have significant atopic dermatitis are colonized with Staph aureus, and there are a number of studies that show that um, there is correlation with disease severity and how much colonization with Staph aureus um, an individual has. So uh, in some situations, the, the colonization is very extensive and the patients develop secondary infections that are widespread and require management with oral antibiotics. 
Um, again, Staphylococcus aureus is the number one pathogen. I will say though we are seeing more emergence of Streptococcus pyogenes in the setting of atopic dermatitis. So we usually recommend using antibiotics that cover both Staph aureus and Strep pyogenes. And these would include cephalexin, um, dicloxacillin or amoxicillin and clavulonic acid. Localized infections may respond to topical therapies such as topical mupiracin. So here we see an example of a secondary bacterial infection. We see lots of deep open skin here. Another example, you can see this patient had lots of pustules and now has scattered erosions. This picture, um, this happened to be a bacterial infection, but this clinical presentation, if I were just seeing this picture, um, a secondary infection with herpes simplex virus could appear very, very similar to that. And sometimes you really need to do cultures to know with certain or other studies to differentiate between secondary staph infections and secondary viral infections. Now, over the last decade, we are seeing more problems with antibiotic resistance, and we are seeing more secondary infections with methicillin-resistant staph aureus. So that's another thing to keep in mind if you're treating a patient uh, with uh, antibiotics and they're not improving, um, you may want to consider culturing the patient to, um, de to determine what the organism is and what the sensitivity profile is to choose your best antibiotics. Here are some examples of methicillin resistant staph infections here, these deep ulcerations on the dorsal hand. And then I think a more typical clue is the development of large furuncles. When I see large furuncles, it it more often is uh, methicillin resistant staph or MRSA than, than it is methicillin sensitive in, in my experience. And that depends a lot on, on where you live. You know, there are some patients, some regions that have lots of MRSA or MRSA, while other regions it's still mainly MSSA. So just another example of a large furuncle. Okay. So I think we've already touched on that. Um, if you do have a community-acquired MRSA, then you certainly need different antibiotics such as clindamycin or trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. If you are using trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, do keep in mind that it doesn't cover strep well. And again, that tends to be, a, that it seems to be an emerging pathogen in the setting of atopic dermatitis. All right. We're going to talk briefly now about viral infections in atopic dermatitis. Um, I've alluded to the fact that herpes simplex virus can be a problem in the setting of atopic dermatitis. And when you have widespread herpetic infection in patients that have eczema, we refer to this as eczema herpeticum. We also see problems with very extensive widespread molluscum contagiosum in the setting of atopic dermatitis. And also some patients can have very extensive warts secondary to human papillomavirus. So I'm going to show you several examples of eczema herpeticum, which can be a very serious condition. Here we see a child that has very widespread disease. This child was about nine months of age and had extensively used immunomodulators in this area. And we can see that the area is just covered with small vesicles and punctate erosions. So this is usually due to type 1 herpes simplex virus. Uh, it can masquerade as a sudden flare of atopic dermatitis or be confused with a secondary bacterial infection. It is important to recognize this because we do tend to treat it quite differently than a secondary bacterial infection. Um, we talked about how you usually will see diffuse vesicles or erosions. This, these are usually worse in the sites of where the patient has eczema and many patients will have associated fever and irritability. And this diagnosis can be confirmed by either doing a Zank smear, if you're comfortable with that study, uh, direct immunofluorescence studies, and or viral cultures. And now I think more people are using PCR studies. Again, the differential diagnosis is usually a severe eczema flare, a secondary bacterial infection, or sometimes even varicella infection can look a little bit like HSV. So these are a few more examples. Again, very extensive herpetic, uh, eczema herpeticum. We can see many, many vesicles and erosions and crusting. We can see this involves the periocular area. And so when we see it around the eye, most people consider that to be an ophthalmologic emergency because we worry about the risk of herpetic keratitis. So we uh, want to get a prompt ophthalmology consult. This is the, just another classic example. You can see the clustering or the herpetiform nature of these uh, vesicles and erosions. And in this patient, we see primarily these punched out 
erosions, which you don't typically see in, in your typical uh, staph or strep infection. Again, another very widespread example. So these can be very, very generalized, especially if the patient's eczema is very generalized. And these are the sorts of patients that we would hospitalize for this condition. So again, very, very widespread erosions here. And another example. And so sometimes you won't see, the point with this picture is that sometimes you won't see the vesicles. These kids are extremely itchy. They may scratch them off. They may coalesce. And you may just see very, very large erosions. But if you look very carefully, you can still see the punctate nature of, of these lesions. So if you do have a patient with that, uh, we tend to manage this by using a cyclovir. We tend to hospitalize if the patient is, is younger and certainly for more severe disease or if they have associated fever and other systemic symptoms. If they're very localized and maybe it's an older child, healthy child, then you can sometimes treat with oral acyclovir. You certainly want to look for any signs of periocular involvement. We usually just treat symptomatically as far as the skin care. We always stop topical steroids. We don't apply them to the blisters or the erosion. And we're really using um, gentle debridement with um, soaks. We're using lots and lots of emollients and then certainly trying to control itching with antihistamines. Again, no topical steroids. There are certainly no immunomodulators during, it, during an active herpetic infection. And then with the these large areas of open skin, you could see how crusty some of these kids are. It's really hard to tell if they're secondarily infected with bacteria as well sometimes. And so very frequently they'll also be on um, antibacterial coverage as well. Okay. I mentioned that children with atopic dermatitis can have growth suppression. So again, that's something to watch for. Um, if you see a patient that has particularly severe eczema, they're going to be at greater risk for that. Um, the etiology for that is not really well understood. Some people question whether therapy can play a role. Um, this is a chronic catabolic state. Are these kids using lots more energy during the day because they're chronically um, scratching their skin? And then again, sleep is, has been a lot of attention to sleep lately about the sleep disturbances. Uh, many of these patients have very disrupted sleep, um, and there are uh, emerging questions about what impact does this have both on, developmental, uh, on development as well as behavior. And I, I think it goes, you know, it's no surprise that all of these, you know, morbidities that can be associated with atopic dermatitis can definitely impact the quality of life and have significant psychosocial uh, side effects. And I think that's something we definitely have to consider. Um, these kids are not only very uncomfortable and itchy, but they are also have um, very visible skin lesions much of the time. And we have to make sure we don't ignore the possibility of depression or anxiety related to the disease. Okay. All right. So We'll conclude on atopic dermatitis. We've talked about it being a chronic skin condition with multiple etiologies. We've talked about the clinical characteristics as well as some of the things to consider in your dif differential diagnosis. We've touched briefly on treatment options as well as associated morbidity. Okay, so that's the end of part one. And now we're going to shift into the case-based part of the presentation. And I have a few cases for you, and then we'll have some discussion after each case. So the first case is a one-year-old female who presents to your office with a history of 10 oval-shaped tan macules and patches that measure about 0.5 to 2 centimeters in size. You note no additional findings on physical examination, and the child is growing and developing normally. The family history is negative for similarly affected family members. What do you do? So here is the child. And you can see these multiple tan to light brown patches of variable size here, most prominent on the trunk. So you're seeing this patient deciding how to work them up. Do you A, reassure the parents that many children have similar birthmarks? B, refer to ophthalmology and dermatology for further evaluation and continue your regular general pediatric care? C, order genetic testing for possible diagnosis of neurofibromatosis? or D, order neuroimaging studies to evaluate for, for NF. Okay. This is not intended to be a trick question. And there probably could be more than one right answer to it. 
I think the best answer is B, and we'll talk about why, but I would say C is probably the second best option. And you're right, we are looking for any signs of neurofibromatosis. Okay, so let's talk about a little bit about cafe au lait macules and neurofibromatosis. Cafe au lait macules are round or oval, flat, light brown lesions. They vary in size from a few millimeters to many centimeters. And they're very common. They occur in about 10 to 20% of the population. And having one or two of these lesions is quite normal. We worry more when we see multiple cafe au lait macules, especially if there's more than five, or particularly large cafe au lait macules. In those situations, we want to think about could there be an underlying syndrome. The lesions themselves are completely harmless. They're just a marker. Um, there's no associated risk of malignancy or anything like that. However, do keep in mind that sometimes congenital melanocytic nevi can look very much like cafe au lait macules in the young infant. So this child clearly had more than six cafe au lait macules, and you're worried about neurofibromatosis type 1. So you want to get a good family history and see you know, if there's any family history, anybody that you may not even just ask about NF, but you want to see if anybody has tan spots. Did anybody have any problems with tumors, bumps on their skin? They may not know the term neurofibromatosis because they may never have been diagnosed and just know what the skin lesions were. Um, the first thing I do when I see a patient like that in my office, aside from doing a full skin exam, is I like to get the ophthalmologist's opinion because if you have one finding on physical exam, one of the, the skin findings, and you have one of the diagnostic eye findings, then you don't really need to pursue the genetic testing because you have a clinical diagnosis and you can save that money and not spend you know, thousands of dollars to try to confirm a clinical diagnosis. Now, you're not always going to see those, those changes, but sometimes that can be very, very helpful, and those often appear over time. And we'll talk about those, but just briefly, we're looking, you're looking for optic gliomas and Lisch nodules on the eye exam. The head circumference is another thing you can monitor with your exam. Head circumference for macrocephaly. Macrocephaly is not a diagnostic criteria, but frequently children with NF have macrocephaly. So you want to look on your physical exam for other features that are common in the setting of NF. You want to closely monitor behavior and development. We know that learning disabilities and speech delay are very common in, in NF, and sometimes some cognitive impairment, but, but not, certainly not always. And then as a dermatologist, I'm looking, and as a general pediatrician, you want to look the child over and look at all of the skin. Um, if you have any of these other skin markings, which we'll go through, so if you have freckling in the skin folds, or you see what looks like a plexiform neurofibroma, or you see cutaneous neurofibromas, and they have cafe au lait, then they have two skin criteria, and again, they would meet diagnostic criteria for NF. Now, if you don't have any other markers, and you're still concerned about neurofibromatosis, then you certainly could order genetic testing or send them to a geneticist to do that testing. It used to be that there was a very high false negative rate, up to about one-third, but the testing has actually improved quite a bit and can be quite reliable. So as, as far as the cutaneous features of NF, the first thing we usually see are the cafe au lait macules. You need, and I think you want to know these criteria for the boards. You're going to have six or more cafe au laits that are more than five millimeters in size if you if have a prepubertal child. And if it's a postpubertal child, those lesions should be greater than 1.5 centimeters in size. That usually is there at birth or early infancy. So if you see a kid who's five years old and only has four cafe au lait macules, the chance of them having neurofibromatosis is extremely, extremely, extremely low. So the next thing is the plexiform neurofibroma. And I'm going to show you a couple pictures. These are not terribly common, so you may not have seen them. Some of them look like congenital melanocytic nevi. Some of them look more like vascular stains. They become very classic over time, but in a young infant, they may not look like a neurofibroma. Intertriginous freckling is known as crow's sign. These are freckles that appear within the axillary and particularly the inguinal folds, and those typically start appearing in older toddlers, somewhere between three and uh, up to five years of age, most of the kids I see by about three. And then finally, the neurofibromas, the more typical um, subcutaneous neurofibromas, not the plexiform ones that are there at birth, 
the neurofibromas generally start becoming more prominent around the time of puberty. So sometime around 10 to 12 years of age, you very rarely are going to see the, the small cutaneous hemangi or, sorry, neurofibromas in the first few years of life. So here we see lots of cafe au lait macules. And then you can see also, this is an older patient, this is a young adult, but you can see he has generalized freckling as well. Now this is a, a toddler that I've taken care of, and she was born with this lesion here on the upper back. Um, when you just look at that, your first thought is probably, well, that looks like a nevus, a congenital melanocytic nevus. But this is actually a biopsy-proven plexiform neurofibroma. So you want to look for any unusual vascular appearing or pigmented lesions on the skin of the young, young infants and children. Because if I have cafe LAs and I have a biopsy-proven plexiforma neurofibroma, then again, I have a diagnosis. This is an older child. This is another plexiform neurofibroma. Um, you can see that there's hyperpigmentation that looks cafe au lait like and then this overlying hypertrichosis. And this, this is a much more evolved lesion. This is a teenager, and these lesions, unfortunately, are progressive. They tend to get a lot thicker. Um, some people describe the more mature plexiform neurofibroma as feeling, having the texture of a, of a bag of worms. So it's, it's pretty distinctive. Okay, in regards to the freckling, again, usually start peering by about age three or so, usually symmetrical in the axilla and in the inguinal folds. I often see them in the neck as well. And then this is an individual, this is a young adult, and um, these neurofibromas look different, again, depending on your background skin color. With darker skin, they're going to more, look more like a dark brown color, whereas in very fair skin, they appear more of a pinkish lilac color. So all of these raised lesions, which you might think look like moles or seborrheic keratoses or something else, all of these small raised lesions are neurofibromas. Some of them are deeper subcutaneous lesions, as in these examples here. Those, again, are also neurofibromas. And when you push them, they just kind of push in. They say they have a, the buttonhole sign. So as I mentioned, you always want to get your ophthalmology colleagues involved to look for Lish nodules and optic gliomas. Lish nodules are present in the majority of patients, usually by about six to seven years of age. These are benign lesions. I think of them kind of as the cafe au lait. They're markers, but they don't have any pathology associated with them. But they're iris hamartomas, and you can actually see them with the naked eye and light-eyed light individuals, but you need a slit lamp exam to see them um, in darker-skinned individuals. Other eye findings include choroidal nevi, eyelid neurofibromas, congenital glaucoma, and then optic gliomas. And the incidence of optic gliomas in the setting of neurofibromatosis is about 15%. Many of these patients are asymptomatic. Um, they're not always apparent on exam. Sometimes you need to do neuroimaging to see them, and that is a very controversial area, whether these patients all warrant neuroimaging to look for them or not. Do keep in mind, though, that not all patients that have optic gliomas have NF. Only about 25% of patients with optic glioma have a diagnosis of neurofibromatosis. So here's an example of the Lish nodule. So you can see these little brown globules within the eye. Okay. I think it, you've probably gone over some of this with the geneticists, but um, you also want to be familiar with some of the characteristic bony abnormalities. So I mentioned that uh, macrocephaly is very common, but it's not a diagnostic criteria. Short stature is common. Scoliosis is very common, so I always recommend that, the, that those patients be screened very carefully for the development of, of scoliosis. But again, not diagnostic. The two pathognomonic bony um, changes that can occur in NF include sphenoid wing dysplasia and pseudarthrosis of the tibia. But these are seen in a very small minority of patients, so they're not usually what help you make the diagnosis. This is an example of the macrocephaly. This is an example of pretty significant scoliosis. And this was a 15-year-old girl who presented to my clinic for moles or something unrelated. And we always try to do a full skin exam. And this was her first visit, and she had never, never been diagnosed with NF. And she certainly had all the typical features. So we, we've kind of touched upon other clinical features. Learning disabilities are very common, be behavioral abnormalities, speech delay. Seizures are very uncommon. We tend to see those more in the setting of tuberous sclerosis. 
Headaches are very common. Um, we know that there are some vascular complications that you get in NF um, involving cerebral vessels, gastrointestinal vessels, and a small minority of patients may develop renal artery stenosis and or hypertension. Uh, we know that precocious puberty and CNS tumors are more common in the setting of NF. And then the dermatologists are pretty aware that they can get more juvenile xanthogranulomas, which are small, benign tumors that have a very yellow um, appearance. I'm sure you've gone over the genetics, but we know there's a mutation in a tumor suppressor gene, neurofibromin, which leads to increased development of different neoplasms, some of these involving the central nervous system, such as the optic gliomas, meningiomas, schwannomas, and others that involve other organ systems, like pheochromocytoma, Wilms tumor, rhabdomyosarcoma, and leukemias. And there's some controversy, but there's some belief that patients that have multiple juvenile xanthogranulomas carry an increased risk of developing leukemia. Also, especially those plexiform neurofibromas have some risk of malignant degeneration, and you can get neurofibrosarcomas. Okay, so I think the best answer is ophthalmology and dermatology evaluations to look for other signs of NF in the patient that I showed you. Um, however, if there aren't other signs and you're suspicious, in some situations I think genetic testing is, is quite appropriate. I mentioned that neuroimaging studies are very variable, and they're, they're normal a lot, so that's not a good way to make a diagnosis of NF. Okay. Just briefly, as far as the differential diagnosis of cafe au lait macules, I already mentioned that early congenital melanocytic nevi can sometimes be very flat, very light, and look very much like cafe au lait macules. And sometimes I just frankly can't tell what it is when I'm seeing an infant who's just a couple months of age or shortly after birth. Over time, though, the difference usually becomes much more clear cut. Um, if you really felt an urgency to know in a young infant, you would probably need to do a biopsy if you weren't certain. Another condition that I see that can be confused with cafe au lait is urticaria pigmentosa. Um, these lesions can look a lot alike um, cafe au lait. However, they tend to be more poorly defined lesions, and I'll show you some pictures in a little while. They don't have real clear, crisp borders, um, and they often have a little substance to them, so they're slightly raised. When you have a patient that has large, particularly segmental cafe au lait that tend to involve certain regions of the body, you want to think about the possibility of a condition called McEwen-Albright syndrome. And patients that have McEwen-Albright syndrome will sometimes have other clinical stigmata that includes ex accelerated linear growth, any signs of precocious puberty, and very um, specific skeletal defects as well as endocrine abnormalities. This is a young man, and I have only just seen a few patients, so this is not something we see commonly, but this youngster has McEwen-Albright syndrome. He has these very large segmental cafe lays, and you can see how different these are than the, the cafe lays that we see in the setting of neurofibromatosis. And again, the clinical um, features of this condition include the cafe au lait macules, precocious puberty, um, characteristic uh, fibrous, or sorry, characteristic skeletal abnormalities that are, are called polyostotic fibrous dysplasia. So it's basically replacing the normal bony tissue with fibrous tissue, which can lead to many problems for these individuals. And this is due to a completely different gene mutation um, in the GNAS, uh, GNAS gene. And this is the same patient here. You can see, again, these very characteristic cafe au lait, and I imagine you can appreciate these bony abnormalities with the bowing of his arms here. Okay, moving along then, we'll go to case two. Um, this is a 10-month-old male who presents to the office with a history of multiple orange-brown patches and thin plaques. And on first glance, the lesions resemble cafe au lait macules, but you notice that the borders are not well-defined, hint, hint, and that some of the lesions seem to be somewhat erythematous and edematous. The parents report that the lesions are particularly prominent after bathing. What might you do in your office to diagnose this child? So this is the child that you're examining, and you see all these lesions, all these tan macules, and again, some seem to be slightly elevated. You see some areas with redness. What might you do? Do you want to do a Woods Light examination, a potassium hydroxide preparation, a skin biopsy, 
Do you want to gently rub the lesions and observe for the clinical response or none of the above? Great. So uh, D is the correct answer. Um, C was the second most common answer that you guys put. And again, not a bad answer, but usually kind of similar to the genetic testing. We usually don't have to die, uh, biopsy um, to make this diagnosis. So when you rub the lesions and you observe histamine release, which um, presents as redness and swelling of the skin, that's called a positive Derrière sign. And that can be a helpful clinical clue in making a diagnosis of mastocytosis. So we depend upon our clinical exam, Derrière sign being positive, and if it's not classic or you have some question, aren't comfortable with your clinical diagnosis, then certainly a skin biopsy can be very helpful. Um, occasionally measurement of release mediators and metabolites, um, such as serum triptates, can also be helpful, but we don't do those routinely. So there are different forms of mastocytosis in children. The, the two most common are solitary mastocytoma and urticaria pigmentosa. So let's talk first about the solitary mastocytoma, which is a little bit of a misnomer because that refers to patients that have between one and five lesions. Um, the lesions are usually present at birth but um, can appear in infancy or up to a couple years of age. They have a pretty typical appearance, and I'll show you a few examples. Again, it's going to vary depending on your underlying skin tone, but they can be yellow to red-brown. They tend to be round or oval. They're usually slightly raised, um, vary in size, usually between about one and five centimeters, and they're most commonly located on the arms, trunk, or neck. If you look closely, the surface may have what we refer to as a put orange experience or an orange peel texture. Um, and sometimes if the lesions are stimulated, you may see an overlying blister bulla. The typical things that would enter your differential diagnosis would include juvenile xanthogranulomas, melanocytic nevi, spitz nevi, dermatofibromas, or cafe au lait macules. So this is an example of a solitary mastocytoma. You can see it doesn't have real well-defined borders, which is one helpful tip. Um, you can see it's kind of an orange-brown color in this fair skin patient. And I think the most helpful thing is looking at the, the texture of the skin, which has that orange peel texture to it. Uh, the history can also be helpful. If the parent comes in and says that this lesion, you know, intermittently becomes more red, more swollen, it itches more, even blisters, that should really uh, raise your alert for the possibility that that's a mastocytoma. But again, if you're not comfortable with your clinical diagnosis, you certainly could do a skin biopsy, which, would, um, which, which could be confirmatory. Now, the prognosis of these lesions is excellent. They tend to vesiculate less and less over time as the child matures, and they also involute spontaneously, usually by adolescence. We don't tend to treat them. We do recommend that the families uh, try to avoid um, exposure of mast cell degranulators in the affected child. So here are a couple exam uh, more examples, kind of similar color here on the left in this light-skinned kiddo, sort of an orangish-brown color, poorly defined lesion, probably about a centimeter and a half, has that orange peel texture, and then an oval lesion on the wrist of this more darkly pigmented um, patient, but sim similar characteristics. And then you stroke them in clinic. You can either use your finger or you can use like the wooden part of a cotton-tipped applicator. You wait a couple minutes. And typically, the skin will urticate and blister up. Um, you have to be a little bit careful because once in a great, great while, these kids can flush and be can become hypotensive. You know, knock on wood, I've never had that happen, but I've heard stories to that effect. So maybe don't be too aggressive when you're doing that. Um, but you can see both of these patients have typical um, Derrière signs here. You can see the vesiculation. Now, some kids are really reactive. You just pick them up and their skin turns red. So if you have a pretty weak response, what I suggest is stroking another area that's not affected and see if there's any difference. Because I think, again, some kids urticate very, very easily and have dermatographism, and you don't want to overcall the diagnosis. So the, actually the most common form of mastocytosis in kids is urticaria pigmentosa. 70 to 90 percent of childhood mastocytosis is, is this form, and these are patients that have more than five cutaneous lesions. 
Similar to the solitary form, the lesions usually appear before one year of age and are frequently appar apparent at birth. Um, the kids usually present with multiple uh, red-brown to yellow macules, plaques, or nodules. They tend to be most densely distributed over the trunk, um, and there tends to be some sparing of the acral surfaces, and fortunately, the face tends to be spared. In these patients, I think the urticarial flares tend to be a little more common, especially during the first two years of life, uh, and fortunately, this, this condition tends to regress over time as well, but very, very gradually. So here we see two different babies that have urticaria pigmentosa. The child on the left has fewer lesions. Um, the child on the right obviously has many more lesions, too numerous to count, but hopefully you can appreciate some similarity in the color of those lesions. I think that's probably the most helpful thing in lighter skinned kiddos. I do find this diagnosis much more challenging when I have very deeply pigmented patients because they frequently look like um, melanocytic nevi to me. And it's in that setting that I'm much more inclined to biopsy them if, I, if, I, if I'm not confident in my clinical exam. Um, most patients will have disease, especially most children will have mastocytosis that's limited to the skin, particularly if they have early onset in the first few years of life. However, you do want to keep in mind that some children will have systemic involvement, and that's most commonly going to be the gastrointestinal tract, the liver, the spleen, and the bones. So some things that you want to ask about if you have a patient with urticaria pigmentosa, I always ask them about itching because I want them to be comfortable, and I, I might treat that if, if they do have itching. I ask about flushing because if you have gen generalized uh, histamine release, sometimes you can have episodes of flushing and hypotension. Um, patients that have intestinal involvement may have chronic diarrhea, so that's something to ask about. Fainting episodes, headache, um, rarely bone pain if they have skeletal involvement, and again, very rarely they might have growth retardation. But overall, most of these patients will improve significantly by adolescence and improve both based on their symptoms and the reactivity to lesions, as well as the lesions tend to fade over time. So just as showing a couple more examples, this child on the left was actually a patient who was referred to me a few years ago that had come in, seen by another dermatologist, and had been diagnosed as having cafe au lait macules with a concern of neurofibromatosis. This child had urticaria pigmentosa, and then the child on the right that I showed you with the question has urticaria pigmentosa. If you aren't comfortable and you are doing an, uh, a biopsy, there are characteristic histologic features that are diagnostic. This is a stained specimen. This is a GIMSA stain, and so all these darkly staining cells that you see, you can see there are many of them packing up the, filling up the dermis. Um, so a biopsy certainly can be diagnostic and, and may be necessary at times. And this is just a closer uh, view showing the mast cells and these characteristic granules. So uh, when we have patients that have forms of mastocytosis, we counsel them to avo uh, avoid mast cell degranulators. As far as medications, the list that you have here in your handout, many of these are things that kids don't get exposed to. Um, but alcohol sometimes can be in certain medicines and could be a problem. Um, polymyxin B is one of the ones I think they're most likely to get exposed to because that's an ingredient in many of the topical antibiotics and kids are always scratching themselves and cutting themselves and if you're putting a lot of, of um, topical antibiotics on that might cause a problem. I always uh, advise their families you know, to make sure that if they're getting any kind of radiologic procedure done and getting contrast or having general anesthetic that they uh, make the physician aware of this diagnosis. And then what we probably see most commonly as a, a trigger for uh, these lesions to urticate is physical stimuli such as cold, heat, rubbing, you know, after bathing, when they're rubbing the child and drying the child off, sometimes the lesions will urticate. And then often I have seen some kids really flare after certain types of um, insect bites. Okay. So um, we'll go ahead and we'll keep moving on here. Um, case three, this is a 13-year-old female who presents to your clinic with complaints of acne. She reports that she has noted an increasing number of blackheads and whiteheads over the past year with occasional larger pimples, primarily on her nose and chin. She has used a variety of over-the-counter creams with minimal response. Initial treatment regimen might consist of the following. So here is the young lady, and you can see that she has a combination of comedones on her skin as well as a handful of inflammatory papules. Pretty clear her on her cheeks. 
and you're deciding how to approach her. So she's only used some over-the-counter topical medicines without a lot of response. So are you going to give a daily topical retinoid such as tretinoin, daily topical benzoyl peroxide gel, doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day, A and B, which would be a topical retinoid and a topical benzoyl peroxide, or all of the above? Okay, don't let this break you out at all. Um, that's okay. So most of you would use a daily benzoyl peroxide gel or a combination of a topical retinoid and a daily benzoyl peroxide gel. So I think the best answer to this one is D. Um, this child has probably used topical benzoyl peroxide already if she's used a number of different topical over-the-counter medications. So that's one reason that I, I wouldn't just choose the topical benzoyl peroxide. The other reason is because if you look at her picture, um, you could see that she had very significant comedonal acne, particularly on her forehead. And really the topical retinoids are going to be your best agent for significant comedonal acne. So that combination of the benzoyl peroxide and the topical retinoid is going to be your best option. I'm happy to see that very few people put doxycycline. This child may end up needing doxycycline, but that probably wouldn't be your first line approach in someone who hasn't really been on any prescription medicines, never been on a topical retinoid or anything. And we always want to use the oral medications in conjunction with a good topical regimen, so we, we don't use oral antibiotics as monotherapy and acne. So let's talk a little bit about um, acne vulgaris. You will probably have some questions about that on the board. And I'm not going to go through all of this in great detail. This will all be in your handout, so we'll try to hit on the high points so we can move on to some, some other topics. But we know that acne is very common in our adolescent population. This is a disorder of the pilosebaceous unit. We, know that our, we don't know the exact cause of acne, but we know there are multiple factors that can contribute to the pathogenesis, and that includes the increased hormonal stimulation of sebum in our adolescent patients, abnormal follicular keratinization and the formation of the comedones, bacterial overgrowth, and that, that responsible bacteria is the Propionobacterium acnes, and then the inflam body's inflammatory response. So the first thing that happens is you have abnormal, well, the first thing you actually have, an, have happen is increased sebum production. And this contributes to the abnormal shedding of the hair follicle lining, and that leads to blockage of the pilosebaceous unit. So you have this accumulation of epithelial cells and sebum within that blocked follicle, and that is what we refer to as a microcomedo. This increased sebum protection usually starts at about eight to nine years of age. Um, it could occur earlier if you had a patient who had precocious puberty or some underlying endocrine abnormality, but typically about eight to nine, and it's due to um, the production, increased production of the DHEAS. Um, okay, so here is our typical distribution of acne. We know this occurs on the face, the chest, the back, the shoulders. So it's where we have um, our oil glands. The bacterial overgrowth is due to P. acne. This is an anaerobic gram-positive diphtheroid, and this is an organism that colonizes pilosebaceous follicles, and it utilizes sebum as a nutrient for a growth, so it thrives in that location. Um, the, the P. acnes attracts neutrophils to the pilosebaceous unit um, and also hydrolyzes triglycerides and sebum to free fatty acids, and this leads to an inflammatory response where the neutrophils ingest P. acnes, they liberate hydrolytic enzyme and they damage the, the follicle wall. Um, so all of these inflammatory responses lead to the formation of our inflammatory pustule, papule, or even nodule formation. Now I mentioned if you have a kid who's less than eight years of age that has significant acne, I think you always want to think about is there some underlying endocrine abnormality here that's causing this child to have acne a little earlier than normal? Um, and I think you certainly want to do a good exam looking for any signs of precocious puberty. You want to look at their growth curve and see if they have accelerated, accelerated linear growth. And it certainly wouldn't hurt to refer to endocrinology um, in, in this setting. <coughs> 
So we talked a little bit about the or sorry, the skin lesions and acne. Acne typically starts with non-inflammatory lesions or the closed comedones, which people refer to as whiteheads, and open comedones, which are referred to as blackheads. The inflammatory lesions are usually a later development, um, and patients have papules, pustules, nodules. When you have a papule that's greater than five millimeters, we usually refer to that as a nodule, and even um, in severe acne, we can see the development of cysts. And unfortunately, a significant percentage of acne will leave scars, and these can be pits or depressions, or occasionally um, hypertrophic scars or keloid formation. There are a number of different acne severity scores. Um, you kind of just have to develop your own gestalt when you're treating acne, um, but these usually um, are based on the number of lesions and whether they're comedones or whether they're inflammatory lesions. So um, this can often help in directing what treatment you use, and a lot of the algorithms are based on whether the acne is mild, moderate, or severe. And we'll talk just a little bit about some approaches you might take with different degrees of acne. So your typical uh, topical therapies are going to include benzoyl peroxide, topical antibiotics, uh, combination products that have benzoyl peroxide and an antibiotic, which is usually erythromycin or clindamycin, um, and then the topical retinoids, which we mentioned earlier, azelaic acid. Um, and then our systemic therapies are usually oral antibiotics, which is typically the tetracycline family of antibiotics and erythromycin. And then for more severe nodule cystic acne or for recalcitrant inflammatory acne, we consider the use of oral retinoids, particularly isotretinoin, which previously was referred to as Accutane. For young ladies with um, significant acne, particularly if there are signs of increased androgens, if they have hirsutism, if they have particularly irregular periods, using hormonal therapy such as oral contraceptives or spironolactone can be very helpful as well. So um, we'll just briefly touch on each of these agents. Topical benzoyl peroxides work primarily because they're bactericidal and they also decrease the inflammatory response. And benzoyl peroxides are, are usually used with, with some degree of success with mild to moderate inflammatory acne. Um, these are available over the counter without a prescription and they range in strength from 2.5% to 10%. And like most of the topical acne medicines, they can cause irritation, redness, dryness, irritation is the most common side effect. One thing you want to keep in mind of all the anti topical antibiotics, benzoyl peroxides are the most likely to cause an allergic contact dermatitis. Topical antibiotics um, also decrease the concentration of P. acnes and decrease inflammatory mediators. You do have to keep in mind, though, that when you're using topical antibiotics as monotherapy, there's a very high risk that the P. acnes will be, become resistant to the antibiotic. So they're very rarely used alone as therapy, and they're almost always used in combination with the benzoyl peroxide. Side effects are similar, irritation drying, um, and various products exist, including erythromycin, clindamycin, and sodium sulfacetamide. As I mentioned, topical retinoids are, are probably the best medication for preventing the development of comedones. They normalize the desquamation of the follicular epithelium, and they're really the best preventative topical medication that we have. And so top, uh, dermatologists will usually use a topical retinoid as first-line therapy. However, sometimes we're limited because those medications may not be approved until we've um, tried um, a topical benzoyl peroxide, which tends to be much less expensive. The original family was the Retin-A family, or, or tretinoin. There's a number of synthetic retinoids available now that, that in some situations are less irritating, such as adapalene, and then more recently the addition of tizeratine. Uh, tizeratine is probably the strongest topical retinoid, and I think the thing you want to remember about that is it's um, potentially teratogenic. Um, it's pregnancy class X, so you really want to be very careful using that in your young females. In regards to oral antibiotics, these are really uh, reserved more for moderate to severe acne that's not responsive to a good topical regimen. They're bactericidal and anti-inflammatory. They decrease P. acne's colonization. And the most commonly used ones we mentioned are erythromycin and the tetracycline family. Okay, in your, in your handout, there's a sort of some recommended treatment guide, guidelines, and we're going to go through a few patients. So we already went through the one young lady who had fairly, my, I would say, mild to moderate mixed acne with comedones and inflammatory lesions. This young man we see has 
more inflammation. You can see more inflammatory papules and pustules. You can see he has a lot more cheek involvement. The other young lady had more of the T-zone involvement that we see in early acne. So how would you approach this kiddo? Well, this is a patient that I would probably get on a good topical regimen, and depending on what he had done, you know, at this point, if he, what he had tried already, I would probably have him on a minimum of a topical retinoid um, once a day, plus a combination benzoyl peroxide antibiotic um, topical medication, so one medicine in the morning and one in the evening. If he had already done a lot of topical therapies, I would probably go ahead and put him on a low-dose oral antibiotic. So I think this is a patient you could pr approach a couple ways, also depending on how bothered the patient was and the family's feeling about being on um, oral medicines. This is a youngster. You're, there's no way you're going to control this young man with a topical regimen alone. So we can see he's got many, many inflammatory papules and some nodules on his face. And more concerning are the nodular lesions that he's developed on his chest with a very, very high risk of scarring and probably already some formation of scars. So this is a child that if he comes to me and he already has this, I may jump right to isotretinoin and not do anything else because I'm concerned he has scarring already. And this is certainly the patient that I would refer right away. Okay, so that's it on acne. Um, this is case four. This is a 14-year-old female who presents with a multi-year history of progressive inflammatory papules on the cheeks, nose, and chin. Her chest and her back are clear, and you do not observe any open or closed comedones. What medications would you prescribe? So would you use topical adapalene gel, a combination of benzoyl peroxide and an antibiotic product, oral doxycycline, all of the above, or none of the above? Great. So the majority of you put none of the above, and the rest of the responses were sort of mixed. So those of you that put none of the above were thinking, that looks a little fishy for acne. I don't, I don't think that's acne, and it's not. So here's another clue for those of you that, that thought that was acne. You do your good full skin exam looking for anything else unusual, and on exam you see that this patient has several scattered hypopigmented patches as well as a large skin-colored plaque on the back with a pot orange texture. What does this patient most likely have? Right, tuberous sclerosis. So this is one of the genodermatoses that you want to be familiar with for your boards, and I think you've already talked about it. Um, but again, another autosomal dominant neurocutaneous disorder. Um, more than 75% of these cases are due to new mutations. So more often than not, you won't have a family history of tuberous sclerosis. And this is a disease that's characterized by hematomas of the skin, brain, eye, kidneys, heart, lungs, and bone. And there are two different gene mutations that have been um, identified. Patients that have um, mutations in the Hamerton gene, or TSC1, tend to have milder disease as compared to those that have tuberin mutations, or type 2. There are several cutaneous features that can really help you make a diagnosis of tuberous sclerosis, and we're going to go through each one. Um, so to introduce this, the first and most common thing that you're going to see are hypopigmented macules and patches, and those are present usually in 80 to 90 percent of patients, and they're often present at birth, although they may be very subtle, especially in a fair-skinned child. The next thing you'll typically see are facial angiofibromas, and again, these are very common, also 80 to 90 percent of patients, but these can vary significantly in their severity. These used to be known as adenoma sebaceum. And those usually appear somewhere between two and five years of age. The least common skin finding is the fibromas, and these are periungual, so uh, fibromas around the nails or underneath the fingernails or toenails, and often uh, gingival fibromas. And their typical onset is during puberty, so they're not terribly helpful in making an early diagnosis of TS. And then the collagenomas vary greatly in what literature you read, occur in somewhere between 20 and 80 percent. These uh, vary also when they present. They can be present at birth, but sometimes they won't be noticeable until later childhood. And one common example is the collagenoma, which is in the lumbosacral area, which is referred to as the chagrin patch. 
kind of a misnomer because these are typically raised lesions, whereas patches are flat. Um, and then uh, on the forehead is referred to the fibrous forehead plaque, and that is, is a collagenoma or connective tissue nevus as well. Um, a collagenoma, you have increased collagen in the dermis of the skin. So I'm going to show you some examples of each of these. Here are two examples of the ash leaf macules or the hypomelanotic macules and patches. And these can vary greatly in size and shape. You can see this youngster here has a few on the legs. Some of them are a couple centimeters in size. But if you look closely, you'll see some very small ones here that are just maybe two to three millimeters in size. And some refer, people refer to those as confetti-like lesions. This child has more classic appearance of the ash leaf shape or the oval or lancet shaped lesion. And, and again, that's more the classic. Um, if you have just one or two of these, similar to the cafe lays, it's not at all unusual for a completely healthy individual to have one or a couple hypomelanotic macules or patches on their skin. So don't be alarmed if you see a patient with that. But when you have three or more, you really want to start thinking. And even if you have a couple, I think you want to certainly be looking for any of these other stigmata of tuberous sclerosis. Again, the hypomelanotic lesions are typically present at birth or early infancy, and they do persist, and they're present in the vast majority of patients with tuber sclerosis. However, if you have very light skinned patient, you may need a woods light to appreciate these exams, and you really have to have a completely dark room when you use a woods light, and sometimes they can accentuate those, those subtle lesions. Here's another one. They're obviously much easier to see in a more darkly pigmented individual. And then this was a really unusual one. This was a youngster that I was seeing for tuberous sclerosis. This was his only um, pigmentary abnormality here. This is his thigh. This picture is kind of turned on its side. But this was several centimeters in size, and it was also it was depigmented rather than hypopigmented. So it's very unusual, but he had, all, he had many other features of, of tuberous sclerosis. So um, you just want to keep this in the back of your mind when you're seeing unusual hypopigmented or depigmented lesions. These are two examples of the angiofibromas. You've already seen this girl on the right. She has very extensive angiofibromas. She's a teenager. Um, you can see that they tend to like the medial cheeks here and these nasolabial folds in the nose. But you can see she has the sparing of her forehead. And that's one big clue to tell you that this isn't acne, because typically acne is going to involve your T-zone. And I wouldn't expect complete clearing of the forehead like that. This um, young man on the, on the left side has more subtle lesions. And in his darker skin, these lesions don't have the you know, pink to red appearance that the, the fair-skinned young lady has. And these were actually called acne for, for some period of time and weren't recognized as angiofibromas. So it can be quite subtle. And you can see, again, has relative sparing of his, of his forehead and a predilection for these lesions around the folds of the nose. OK. Again, usually present by two to five years of age, vary in color from skin color to pink to red to tan. Um, we talked about the distribution and the, the occasional confuse, uh, confusion between um, angiofibromas and acne. Here is another example. This child's about five to six years of age. You can see he's already got numerous um, facial lesions here, similar distribution. And this is a closer view of the teenage girl you've already seen. And you can see how large some of these lesions have become and, again, how they like to involve the nasolabial folds. This is the connective tissue nevus, also referred to as a collagenoma, or affectionately known as the chagrin patch. Um, these are typically skin colored to tan to light pink. Uh, they vary in color, they vary in size, but they usually have somewhat of a lumpy, bumpy texture to them, and in some cases have an orange skin type texture. These can be present at birth or appear later in childhood. You can have one large lesion or you can have multiple smaller lesions. And sometimes, again, they can be quite subtle in appearance. This is a textbook example of a classic fibrous plaque of the forehead, which, again, is, is a connective tissue nevus or collagenoma. And these are subtle, but I hope you can see them over here. This youngster has these pink um, plaques here on the side of the back. And this is another fairly subtle example. This is the mid-back 
Hopefully you can see this right here, this skin colored plaque and this area here. I do want to mention that you can have connective tissue nevi or collagenomas without having tuberous sclerosis. Um, that is not uncommon at all. I see more patients that just have a solitary collagenoma that don't have tuberous sclerosis. But if you see this in the setting of hypomelanotic macules, angiofibromas, it, it definitely is one of the cutaneous criteria for diagnosis. The fibromas are the least common and certainly what I have seen the least usually appear um, at puberty and they're considered pathognomonic when you have more than one. So here we can see a few subtle ones here on the great toenail at the base, another one right there, a much larger one here. And this was in the, the teenager girl that you've seen several pictures of already. Um, because there are uh, mutations in tumor suppressor genes, it's not unusual that you would see formation of tumor similar to uh, what we see in NF. Um, there are a variety of different sorts of tumors that can be seen in tuberous sclerosis that you've probably reviewed with the geneticist. Um, for the eye lesions, you can see retinal hamartomas. Um, other eye abnormalities include papilledema or optic atrophy. Um, for the cardiac lesions, you can get cardiac rhabdomyomas. These are, tend to be present prenatally or early in life and, and usually regress over time. The kidney lesions tend to not be present uh, prenatally or in the neonatal period, but tend to develop more over time. And this is more common with the type 2 tuberous sclerosis. They get the polycystic kidneys and the angiomyolipomas, estimated to occur in about 15% of patients. Uh, and then rarely you can see um, pulmonary or bony abnormalities. Um, we know that uh, neurologic features are an important part of this condition. As I mentioned, seizures are very unusual in NF, but about 80% of patients with tuberous sclerosis do have seizures. These tend to be very early in their onset. Uh, they can be myoclonic generalized or focal seizures. They can have hip syrhythmia. Um, pretty high rate of mental retardation, much higher than with NF, about 60% rate of mental retardation. And this seems to correlate quite well with the severity of the seizures, so that patients that don't have seizures usually do not have mental retardation. Um, these patients can develop significant findings that are very um, characteristic on MRI scans, so neuroimaging in the setting of tuberous sclerosis is usually much more helpful in making a diagnosis than it is in the setting of neurofibromatosis. And some of the things you might see are brain calcifications, subependymal hamartomas, um, and rarely malignant gliomas. So we've talked already a little bit about the genetics. We won't go through that any anymore. Um, again, it's the type 2 where you see um, potentially uh, the renal cysts Okay, this is case five. Um, this is a two-month-old who presents to your clinic with a red flat patch on the upper face and periorbital region. This is noted at birth. Um, so the child's now two months of age and hasn't changed much in appearance. What is the most appropriate clinical management at this time? So do you reassure the parents that this birthmark will likely fade away by the time the child is five years of age? Do you obtain a baseline ophthalmologic evaluation to screen for glaucoma? Would you like an echocardiogram to rule out coarctation of the aorta or other cardiac defects? Or would you like to obtain a head CT as soon as possible? Okay, great. So the majority of you selected B, obtain a baseline ophthalmologic evaluation to screen for glaucoma, and that is the correct answer. Um, D, I think you were thinking along the right lines of the diagnosis here, but um, a head CT as soon as possible probably won't give you the answer that you're looking for, and we'll talk about why. So this patient had a capillary malformation of the face, otherwise known um, in lay terms as a port wine stain. This is a congenital vascular anomaly. These are usually present or apparent at birth. They affect about 1 in 300 newborns, and these are permanent vascular malformations, most commonly located on the face. So I'm going to show you a few examples. This is a youngster. You see he's got it on the mid-face there. And this is a malformation of mature capillaries in the upper dermis. 
the lesions tend to be pink to red initially. Over time, they may become more raised and nodular um, and, and more violaceous in color. And unfortunately, with these being permanent lesions, they can be associated with significant psychological morbidity. Now, the youngster that I showed you the picture of had involvement of the first and second branch, the ophthalmic branch and the maxillary branch of the trigeminal nerve, or the V1 and V2 branches. In that setting, we worry about the possibility of the patient having associated glaucoma. And so the best answer for that was to do an ophthalmologic exam and to screen for uh, glaucoma. So that patient should have a baseline examination and they should also have lifelong follow-up to continue to screen for glaucoma because glaucoma usually doesn't have um, very obvious symptoms that a family would pick up on or the pediatrician would necessarily pick up on. So this was the child that you saw the picture of. We usually think of the uh, V1 distribution as being the eyelid and up. So if you have the eyelid or forehead scalp, that's going to be V1. This mid-face distribution here is going to be V2, and that's where we really worry about glaucoma. And then V3 would be the lower face. The other thing we worry about when we have involvement of V1 is, is the possibility of central nervous system involvement and the Sturge-Weber syndrome. Sturge-Weber syndrome um, is typically seen in the setting of a facial port wine stain that involves V1 plus or minus V2 and V3. And it has been observed that it's seen more commonly in children who have bilateral uh, facial capillary malformations. Another thing that is seen and, and may give you a clue is that you are more likely to see progressive soft tissue and skeletal hypertrophy in the setting of Sturge-Weber syndrome for reasons that are not well understood. But keep in mind, there are far more children that have a capillary malformation on their forehead or their upper face that have just an isolated vascular malformation without any central nervous system involvement. And it's estimated that up to 10% or 10% or, or less have associated Sturge-Weber syndrome. So you certainly don't want to assume that that patient has it simply because they had that distribution. So now this child is very high risk. This child has a bilateral lesion. She has involvement of, of V1 through V3. And there have been some studies that have also shown that the risk is greater when you have involvement of the overlap area between V1 and V2, which some people call the watershed area, so this um, periocular involvement. So this child was diagnosed early on because she had neonatal seizures. She had early um, diagnosis of glaucoma, and um, she certainly had the classic capillary malformation. This is the same child after several treatments with pulse dilator. Still a very visible lesion, but clearly much lighter than it was early on. That is one of the board's uh, content specifications that you want to be familiar with um, pulse dilator, and that can be a, a successful modality to treat uh, facial capillary malformations or port wine stains. So this is the laser that I'm referring to. This typically has a wavelength between 585 and 595 nanometers. Um, it targets the intravascular hemoglobin. It penetrates very minimally, only 1.2 millimeters, so it's a very safe laser with a very, very low risk of scarring if used correctly. Um, if you are going to laser port wine stain or capillary malformation, it tends to take multiple treatments, usually treated every six to eight weeks, and the resultant uh, lightening is very gradual. There is some question, though, that you know, this is not a cure for most patients. If you stop lasering, it's possible that the lesion could then darken again over the next several years. And this procedure can be done with local or general anesthetic. So this is an example. This child has a more limited capillary malformation, but again, you see it involves V1 and V2. It involves this area around the eye here. And this child had Sturge-Weber syndrome as well, and this is just showing the results of a procedure um, with pulse dye laser. And you can see the areas of fading from the laser. So there are several, you know, Sturge-Weber is a triad. You're going to have the skin manifestations, the ocular manifestations, and the central nervous system abnormalities. The ocular features, the most common thing is going to be um, seeing choroid vascular anomalies and having increased ocular pressure with the risk for the development of glaucoma. If you have uh, congenital glaucoma and uh, enlargement of the eye, that's referred to as boopthalmos. And that's not common, but it's quite significant. The central nervous system features vary significantly and can be very, very mild or can be very, uh, very, very dramatic early on. Um, you tend to see cerebral atrophy on the affected side. 
um, you will see a vascular malformation of the ipsilateral leptomeninges, which will usually appear as leptomeningeal enhancement. You'll often see enlargement of the choroid plexus on the same side. And very gradually over time, you will see the development of tram track calcification that tends to develop um, beneath the malformation, most commonly in the temporal and the occipital cortex. So I would be familiar with what your radiologic features are with um, Sturge-Weber syndrome. Um, about 70% of patients that have Sturge-Weber syndrome will have seizures. So similar to tuber sclerosis, seizures are very common in this setting and also tend to correlate with mental retardation. Those patients that don't have seizures usually don't have significant mental retardation. The other thing that can be seen with Sturge-Weber is hemiparesis. So here is a scan where you can see some of these features. Here we see some cerebral atrophy.